Um, and uh, he's um, managing partner at Proteus Venture Partners. He's going to talk today about the regenerative medicine funding landscape, a new collaborative capital efficient model. Could we please welcome Greg to the podium? Greg, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pick up some of the themes that uh, Navik has just articulated from the U.S. perspective, and I've got a slightly different take on a couple of things. Uh, Navik's perspective was for the investors in public companies, and can you make money in the space? I think the data he presented is pretty compelling that you can. Um, I'm going to take a look at it both from that perspective, but from the perspective of you guys who are out there raising money. Um, you may be investors in the space. I certainly am through Proteus. Uh, we are operating a growth fund that invests in publicly traded companies, and we've done well following the trends that Navic has identified. Uh, but I suspect what's more important for you guys is what does this say about how I could raise money and where can I raise money and what's the funding environment look like? So here's what I'm going to talk about quickly. Um, some of the stuff you've heard before, I'm going to jump through this very quickly. There's no question that the field has made tremendous progress in the last 10, 15 years. Just witness the discussion this morning and look at the agenda. There's some tremendous things happening in the field. So there, for me, there's no question but that the technology has moved forward at a very dramatic pace. And in fact, I think we're further along now uh, than I thought we were going to be when we first started these uh, conferences with uh, Chris and the team years ago. Um, the, probably the best measure there is clinical activity. Uh, Chris has published a wonderful paper uh, with Emily on uh, clinical activity, and if there's any one measure of the maturation or growth of the field, it's the level of clinical activity, and there's just been tremendous clinical activity in the field with a lot of stuff now in phase three trials, so we're going to see some things emerging into the market. So the underlying value proposition for the field of regenerative medicine, I think, is very solid and is growing. Uh, but historically, we've had a problem. Uh, investors have simply not been interested. And not, it's not that they haven't been interested. They all got burned very badly in the first cycle. And the venture community, once you've heard me say this before, once a nuclear bomb goes off in your portfolio, you're a little reluctant to get back into the sector. And we're still suffering from some of that. Uh, 2009 to 2012 was an incredibly difficult fundraising environment. Many of you know that personally. Um, it's still, actually, frankly, fairly challenging. Um, if you are lucky enough, and this is going to be the, the, the guts of what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes, if you're lucky enough to be raising money in the public markets, and the data that Navic has just presented and the data I'm going to present from the U.S. perspective uh, suggests that you're going to find it relatively easy to raise money, relatively easy to raise money in the U.S. markets. If you're not in a position to go public or if you're not already public and trying to raise money through a secondary, um, you're going to face bigger challenges. Um, here's a little more data on what happened in the 2009-2012 cycle. I apologize for the chart. It's a bit of an eye chart, but the, the bottom line takeaway from this message is most of the financings that were done were debt financings, um, and there was very little venture capital that was funded in there. Good news is we're coming out of that cycle. Um, we're coming out of the worst financial crisis in 75 years. I think we're, f we're well beyond the point where we're, we're now out of it and climbing out. And that is impacting uh, all the way across the sector. <clears throat> the really good news, as Navik said, is that the biotech IPO is back in favor. There are virtually no biotech IPOs during the period from 2009 to 2012. And <clears throat> the window opened up again uh, a year ago in July. And uh, that is great news because if you don't have biotech, if you don't have IPOs at the end of the cycle, you guys have all seen my, my chart on how biotech is funded. If you don't have that component piece at the back end where the venture guys can get their companies public and command an exit of some kind, they're going to be reluctant to get in the market. So it's critical that you have access to the public markets, both to generate a return for the venture guys, uh, which are going to fund the early stage development, and then, of course, you need the public markets in order to fund your phase three trials. So the fact that biotech IPOs are back is wonderful news for all of us, and it has been a heck of a run. Um, 2013 was a record year for biotechs. To more than $2.7 uh, billion raised, best I biotech IPO window since uh, 2000, and uh, the biotech stocks that went out performed very well. Now, Navic presented data on the UK side of the equation. If you're looking at the LSE and AIM, similar data is available for the US. It really was quite a run. Um, and the, the party continues, at least into the first quarter of 2014. Now, the mood has changed pretty dramatically in this quarter. Uh, but the first quarter of 2014 was quite impressive. We actually did more biotech IPOs in the first quarter of 2014, uh, not, 
more, I'm sorry, we did more in the first quarter than we did in three quarters in 2013, okay? So the first quarter was, a, was just a run on what had happened before. Um, and one of the great things for many of you who have not yet gotten your stuff into a phase three trial, uh, we saw for the first time in years, not just in this window, but for the first time in probably 10 years, you saw IPOs that went out on less, on phase two data, less than phase two data, okay? Um, you couldn't even get venture funding if you didn't have phase two data in 2009 to 2012. Well, it turns out in 2013, you can go to the public markets and get your company public on data that was not yet to phase three. We had nine, six companies total in 2012, 2013, and then another one that uh, went out early in 2014 uh, that had less than completed full phase two data. Um, in this cycle, now this, the data I've just presented to you is on the biotech sector as a whole. The question you're asking is, what does that tell me about regenerative medicine companies? The great news is that a big chunk, more than a quarter of the companies that went public during this run uh, were regenerative medicine companies, and I won't go in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm sure many of these companies are familiar to you guys. Uh, look at the numbers that they raised, um, and it's quite impressive. Okay, so we had eight companies, CDI, Oncomed, Heat, uh, Reprosil, it's a pretty remarkable story. Uh, and that was followed by Mega Carrion. Uh, if you follow the Mega Carrion story in Japan, the Japan market has been white hot. Um, and Mega Carrion raised a huge amount of money, something on, or I'm sorry, achieved, they raised a huge amount of money and achieved a market cap that was something in excess of $500 million on essentially a research project. And, if you ever wondered if there's a value of the name Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, um, Reprosil is a pretty good example of what you get there. Um, so why did it open? Why did this happen? Why did the biotech window reopen? A couple of reasons. Biotech industry is finally profitable. You know, so for years we've been talking about whether you could overall justify the investment in biotech as a whole because <clears throat> the total number of products in the market and the revenues they generated hadn't <clears throat> justified the very substantial investment in capital, uh, both from government sources, the NIH, DARPA, et cetera, the MRC, um, and from uh, venture capitalists. And for years, the numbers didn't work, okay? More money had been invested in biotech than we had generated in terms of returns, but that turned around about five years ago. So the industry has started, got pulp profitable about five years ago, and it has been building significant profits ever since, uh, $7.7 .7 billion in, in uh, in profit in 2012. Um, since 2010, and I've again presented some of this data from the UK perspective, the biotech sector has uh, substantially outperformed other sectors. And I'm gonna show you in a second some charts on the Dow, on the BTK, and then a very interesting chart on our own cell therapy index that, that uh, Chris and the team, uh, we have uh, put together that tracks top 25 cell therapy or cell therapy regenerative medicine companies that are public. The answer here though is that the biotech sector has pretty substantially outperformed uh, the other indices, whether you're looking at the Dow, whether you're looking at a subcomponent of the Dow, uh, the best place you could have been for the last five years, and again, it's consistent with Novik's data, uh, is in the biotech sector. Uh, substantial cash reserves sitting on the sidelines. There'd been a huge pool of cash that developed following the collapse and the collapse, the, well, it was a collapse, the significant problems we had in the 2008-2009 sector in the U.S. As you all know, the federal government has been printing money like mad and pouring that money into the financial <coughs> sector um, and to, quote, stabilize the banks that basically bankrupted our country. Um, but, you know, we made them all a lot of money and they sat on it. And uh, there's been a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines and uh, that cash finally got activated and interest in getting back into the market. And then for us in the biotech sector and particularly for regenerative medicine companies, probably the most important thing is the Jobs Act. Now you guys may not have focused on the Jobs Act, but one of the things that the Jobs Act did is it made it a lot easier for you to go public. It narrowed the timeframes for going public and it limited the amount of public disclosure that you had to make. 
And if you're ever in a situation where you are gonna go public, I hope you all get there, uh, what you're gonna find is when you sit down with your team of 25 lawyers in the conference room who are doing your, your book, um, is the IP lawyers over here arguing with the business lawyers over there because the IP <coughs> lawyers don't want to release all the information that you're supposed to release as part of your material disclosure obligations when you go public. It's a big challenge. And there are companies that have chosen not to go public because of the material disclosures that they've had to make prior to the JOBS Act. The JOBS Act solved that problem to some extent by allowing you to have this period when you could file and not make major disclosures. And you, could, you only then had to make some, and not all of those disclosures, once you had raised your book, once you had raised your capital, which made it a lot easier for you uh, to get your company in a position to go public. Promised you some charts. Here's the first of them. Um, biotech index has outperformed the NBI, which is the NASDAQ Biotech Index, has perform outperformed all other index by a factor of 2x in the US. Now, this is just US data. This is the NASDAQ and the Dow. It does not factor in the LSE data, but I think you'll see this is entirely consistent uh, with the data that Navic just presented. Good news for us in this room is the cell therapy index, the index that, that Chris and the team have created. Uh, which tracks regenerative medicine companies uniquely. And what we did there is we took the top kind of 75 companies that are publicly traded in the field, uh, made cutoffs as Novic did. Um, our cutoff was a $50 million market cap. We had a per share price and a certain trading volume. And we filtered on those companies down to the top 25 companies and created an index and began gathering data about how those companies had performed over time and here is the cell therapy index in the upper quadrant. So echoing a theme that Novik uh, raised, if you were to have invested in cell therapy companies several years ago, you would have made a very substantial return and certainly it would have been the best sector that you could have been in in any sector in publicly traded companies in the US. Better than the Dow, better than an exchange traded fund uh, or any other exchange traded fund that I'm aware of. Um, the sector did extraordinarily well. Now, a note of caution. Um, we had a very substantial correction in uh, the biotech sector in April. April 7th, the biotech sector lost 7% of its value in a single day, 7%. And it has been trending downward ever since. So um, unfortunately, I apologize. I don't have the updated chart for you. We haven't closed out the quarter. I'm not in a position to be able to present that data next time we see each other. I hopefully will have that data for you. Um, but the dance may be beginning to slow down here, okay? Um, Arnie's shaking his head and saying, no, he doesn't think so, but it's possible. We may be at the end of the cycle. A couple of things indicating that the cycle is coming to the end. All six of the companies that have gone public in the last month have had to underprice their shares, okay? All six of them. They have had to take a lower, in fact, they, they didn't just underprice, they didn't just discount the, the stock, they listed their shares at the very low end of the range that they had originally projected. Um, and then I talked about the biotech sell-off, and uh, one of the things that has become very clear is those six or seven companies that got out on preclinical data or on phase one data, that is not happening anymore. Uh, those companies performed very, very well in the first three months that they were public, and then they basically collapsed. Um, their returns are now negative from the time those companies went out as a group, okay? And they surprised a lot of people, frankly, that those companies had gotten out. Uh, the people who were concerned about it expressed concerns about the ability to sustain value long-term, and those fears have now been consistently um, confirmed across the board. So I don't think, despite the fact that in the last window, uh, we've got some early stage companies out, um, that you're gonna see any early stage companies being listed, uh, in the, in, certainly not in the next 12 months, okay? All right, so with all this good news, I mean it is, we had a little correction, but frankly, given how far the index had risen, you would expect a correction at some point. So I'm not here to tell you that, that, that uh, the sector is collapsing not, you know, far from it. I think we're doing extraordinarily well. But we have had a correction, and you need to be aware of that. Frankly, if you are an investor, as opposed to somebody looking to raise money, you couldn't find a better time to put money into regenerative medicine right now. Um, stocks have corrected pretty substantially, and then some of them, some of the stocks are at, at uh, their 52-week lows. 
So it'd be a reasonable time as an investor, you know, it's free advice, you get what you pay for, you know, so, but it, this may be a good time for you to get in. Uh, but where are the VCs, okay? If we had this uh, tremendous activity um, in the IPO market, uh, where are the VCs? And Navik has said that the VCs have gotten their money back, and, and to some extent that is true. Uh, venture guys did get their money back in the cycle, some of them. Um, but you got to realize the economics of the venture business. It's not enough for a venture guy to invest in a, in a company and 10 years later to get a one and a half X return on their investments. You have to generate a return. If you're in for five years, you got to generate a three X return. If you're in for 10 years, it's got to be 10 X. And if you're in for longer than that, you need to hit a home run in order to justify the kind of IRR that allows you to raise more money. And frankly, that has not happened. Now, PWC has not done their final analysis on 2013 and the venture returns from this cycle, but I suspect when you see it, and I'll, I'll talk about it once the data comes out, I'll get it for you, uh, but I suspect what you're gonna see is that ventures, the venture guys were able to recoup invested capital, no question about that, and they were able to make a modest return on top of it. But realize that the venture business, because of the risk profile for investors, you have to go into an investor meeting and present them with a reasonable case that you can generate a 24% return compounded annually. And if you can't do that, they're probably not gonna give you money. So it's not enough for you to just go in and return one or two X your capital. Uh, that might be good for an individual investor. It doesn't work for a venture guy, okay? Um, and these da this data uh, confirms that. Um, we saw, particularly for early stage investors, pay attention to the, um, the bullet there about VC funding in the low end and early stage. Venture capital guys fled early stage investing. Um, that departure from early stage investing began in 2000, it accelerated in 2008, and it has continued to this day. Um, it is still very challenging to get early stage uh, venture money. Now that is changing, there's no question about about it, that is changing. The venture community is coming back into the sector and there are new venture forms being, uh, new venture funds being formed. We just formed and launched one I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, so it is changing, uh, but it is not changing as rapidly as you would have expected given how positive the IPO market has been for the last 18 to 24 months. Venture guys are still looking for pristine deals. I'm not gonna go through all the venture criteria here. You've seen this before. Uh, the bottom line, these metrics haven't changed and the need for pristine deals have not changed. And the valley of death has still, is still where it is. Uh, despite the fact that a number of companies got public on uh, less than phase two data during this cycle, venture guys are not gonna fund you unless you have phase two data. You're not gonna get a meaningful meeting with most venture guys unless you have phase two data and you're trying to fund your phase three trial. Uh, that really has not changed in the last 24 months. Um, there are some new firm, firms and funds being founded. There are some guys moving back into early stage and that will happen. And I hope when I stand up here next year, I'm gonna be able to tell you the venture con community is now fully engaged in investing in early stage, but it's not here now. It's just not here now, okay? Um, so what does that mean? Okay, you gotta do something differently than you have been doing or many of you have already changed your business models, but that old um, financing strategy of building the mini J&J, &J, the Geron strategy of trying to build a walled garden and fight all comers and, and do it on your own just doesn't work anymore. Um, if you're lucky enough to get public, do it. If you can't, and, and most of you won't uh, be able to, uh, then you gotta find another model. And that model is collaborative, capital efficient research, and finding some way to move your stuff through the clinic and create value in your company and in your technology in the fundamental, fundamental way that value is created in this field. Value is created by moving your technology through the regulatory pipeline, positioning it to get into the market. De-risking your technology is how you create value, moving it through that cycle. You've gotta find a way to do that on a capital efficient basis. You just can't spend the kind of money that has historically been spent. We in this room cannot afford to, to model out 75 to $100 million cost to get your product through a phase three trial. It's just not gonna work. The money's not there for you right now, okay? So you gotta do more with less, okay? How do you do that? Well, one of the things you can do is extend your technology development in an academic setting. If you're still lucky enough to be in an academic setting, stay there. Stay there until you get phase two trial. Why? Because you can lever the, leverage the academic infrastructure. Not only do you get to use the facilities in the university, but you get access to this brain trust in the university. Um, 
you know, if you're, if you're, think about the resources that are available to you if you're in the right academic setting. If you're developing a mesenchymal technology, why wouldn't you want to be at Case Western working with Arnie and the team? Okay, these guys know mesenchymal cells better than anybody else. Okay, if you want to do tissue engineering, why wouldn't you go talk to Tony Atala at Wake Forest? Tony's got a whole translation center set up with a team of people who know how to do tissue engineering very well. Follow that model, okay? You gotta focus and conserve resources, forget multiple shots on goal because you can't afford it, pick your best technology and move ahead with it. I'm not suggesting that you make yourself a one-trick pony and have a single technology, but the notion of trying to build out four or five different platforms at one time, which was the old model, is just not gonna work anymore, okay? And you gotta collaborate, okay? Um, Again, you've heard me say this in the past, I think one of the most promising things that happens in the field is the emergence of translation centers. Uh, there now are a number of translation centers available to you, not the least of which is the Catapult, uh, which has been launched recently here in the UK. Really tremendous facility. Those of you who were at the reception yesterday uh, got an opportunity to see a state-of-the-art facility uh, where you can flow your technologies through. This is an example of the kind of translation centers that have been built over the last several years around the country. Some of the early ones, Arnie's actually responsible for one of the early ones, the National Center for uh, Regenerative Treatments in, in Cleveland. But you've got the McGowan Center in Pittsburgh, Tony Atala's group at Wake Forest, uh, the CCRM in Toronto, which Michael is going to talk about tomorrow. There are a number of these centers emerging. Um, here's uh, examples of a couple of them. There are probably 15 of them out there right now. Um, they're characterized by having state-of-the-art facilities, typically with all the equipment you're going to need to go from a proof-of-concept phase through a phase two trial. They typically have access to vivariums or their own vivarium. Uh, great lab space, as you saw at the Catapult. Um, domain knowledge around a specific technology and clinical trial experience. Um, they're great places to develop your technology. And one of the things I, I hope to, I'm going to close with this is to talk to you about a new translation center that I've been fortunate enough to help launch. Um, for the last uh, six, seven months, we've been working with the New York Blood Center. For those of you who don't know the New York Blood Center, it's a 75-year-old organization in New York founded by the Rockefellers. Uh, they're essentially the American Red Cross on the, west, on the East Coast. Uh, some would say the Red Cross grew out of the Blood Center. Um, they do about 300 million in revenue. They're a nonprofit. They provided a million units of blood or blood products to the East Coast. Um, they have a beautiful research facility with 20 labs, a full vivarium with rats and mice, and a GMP facility that we're building out right now. Um, for the last six months, we have taken, we have been morphing their research capability into a translation center. We've taken five of those 20 labs and turned them into translation labs. We've allocated space in the vivarium for animal work, and we are well underway in completing a GMP-like facility. Uh, it's not going to be full GMP because we won't have the extensive air handling stuff, but we will be GMP to the level required to produce cells for phase one and phase two trials. Um, it's a pretty impressive facility. The team, there are 1,200 employees at the blood center. Uh, some of the most talented people in blood are there, and <clears throat> they have done tremendous research. So there is very deep domain knowledge uh, around blood there. Uh, the blood center also happens to operate the largest public cord blood bank in the world. Uh, Pablo Rubenstein is the director of that group. Pablo filed the original patents on processing cord blood. Uh, their, their public bank has 65,000 units in it. It is the largest public bank in the world. We are in the process of engrafting onto that public bank a private bank to build a hybrid bank model. So what are we going to do in the translation center? We're going to spend most of our time focused, of course, on blood. So we are looking at, uh, we have a pipeline already of about 70 um, technologies and deals. Um, we are looking predominantly at cord blood expansion, engraftment technologies, new collection technologies, new cord blood therapeutics. That's on that side. On the blood side, uh, we are looking at next generation blood products, manufactured blood products, manufactured RBCs, manufactured platelets, um, and other technologies of that sort. And to make it all work, there we go, we've launched a $50 million venture fund. Okay, this is really the coming out story for the, or day for the, the venture fund. I talked briefly about it in Boston a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but we are now officially up and running uh, with a $50 million fund, and there is actually more capital behind it, but our initial allocation is $50 million. Uh, we are managing the fund and with our team, and um, we are looking for 
early stage technologies related to blood. Um, we are not, we are, uh, requirement of the fund is not necessarily that we invest in technologies that are in New York. Uh, we think that we are going to have tremendous capability to move things on a capital efficient basis through the, the translation center, uh, but we're open to investing in blood technologies in the UK. So if you got a blood technology you're interested in moving forward, come and talk to me afterwards. And I can see Chris is telling me it's time for me to move on. So with that, I'll pass. I was going to make a comment about the CCRM, but Mike's going to talk about that tomorrow. Thanks. Great, fantastic talk as always. Thank you very much, Chris. Great, lovely job. Very nice.